Stretching for more than 100 miles through Virginia and West Virginia, the Shenandoah Valley is a beauty which truly has to be seen to fully appreciate. Bound to the east by the Blue Ridge Mountains and by the Appalachian Mountains to the west, the region is a mecca for hikers, historians, and tourists alike. From the James River to Harper's Ferry, there is seemingly something for everybody, including crime. In this feature, we will profile two cases which have confused and frustrated law enforcement since the 1980s. Two cases separated by more than 50 miles in five years. In one instance, a young woman goes missing under mysterious circumstances while working the late shift at a gas station. In another, the identity of a man found murdered along Interstate 81 remains a mystery even though his killer was identified and successfully prosecuted. Our Shenandoah profile begins in June of 1982 at the city of Harrisonburg. Case number 1982-681146, the disappearance of Kelly Berg Dove. Straddling the spine of the Appalachian and Blue Ridge Mountains, the Shenandoah Valley is the scenic and cultural gem of the Virginias. Formerly inhabited by the Seneca Indians, the valley became an enticing draw to many eastern settlers. Rugged frontiersmen, Quakers, Mennonites, and even German settlers, known thereafter as the Shenandoah Deutsch, would soon call the region home. Today, Interstate 81 traverses what was once known as the Great Wagon Road or the Great Warriors Trail. Stretching over 300 miles from Bristol to Martinsburg, the highway serves as a conduit for thousands of tourists, nature lovers, and vacationing families each year. Destinations such as Skyline Caverns, the Appalachian Trail, and the Shenandoah National Park serve as beacons to anyone looking to escape the concrete jungle and retreat to a quiet, rustic setting. Sadly, even a region blessed with such rural elegance and peaceful serenity is far from invulnerable to criminal activity. When speaking of the countryside and its widely scattered populace, even the great Sherlock Holmes was quick to note the only thought which comes to me is a feeling of their isolation and of the impunity with which crime may be committed there. They always fill me with a certain horror. It is my belief that the lowest and vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling and beautiful countryside. Think of the deeds of hellish cruelty, the hidden wickedness which may go on year in, year out in such places, and none the wiser. To wit, in June of 1982, the city of Harrisonburg, Virginia, found itself faced with a perplexing incident which may well have confounded even history's greatest consulting detective. Sometime in the early morning hours of June 18, 1982, 20-year-old Kelly Berg Dove was abducted while working at a local gas station. Over 40 years later, her ultimate fate remains a mystery, and her abductor remains unidentified. Kelly Berg was born on August 30, 1961, one of five children born to Fred and Rachel Berg. With a full household, Kelly's life was never bland or tedious. Her siblings have described her as a fighter and not one to ever back down from a challenge. In 1977, when she was only 16 years old, Kelly gave birth to a daughter, Tammy. 
Kelly soon married Tammy's father, Dale Dove, and the two moved in together. Despite the inherent difficulties in being a teenage mother, Kelly successfully graduated from Turner Ashby High School in 1978 before settling into the normal routine of motherhood. Several years later, Kelly decided that she wanted her daughter Tammy to have a better life than she was currently on track to have. To that end, Kelly decided to enroll in some classes at the nearby community college. In the meantime, Kelly had taken a job at the Imperial Oil Gas Station on the southern side of Harrisonburg, the same station where her sister Elaine worked and her sister Debbie Parnell was the manager. Kelly reportedly had no qualms about working the so-called graveyard or overnight shift alone. The close family connections to the location are said to have given Kelly a sense of security. On Thursday, June 17, 1982, Kelly swapped schedules with another employee to work the overnight shift. At the time, Kelly was living in Bridgewater, approximately seven miles southwest of Harrisonburg. At 10 p.m., Kelly was dropped off for work by her husband, Dale. By all accounts, the first four hours of her weeknight shift were busy but routine. Customers coming and going, gassing up and driving away. Around 11 p.m., Kelly placed a call to her mother, Rachel. Rachel later reported that Kelly did not seem upset or scared at that time. At some point after 2 a.m., things took a dark turn. An unidentified male showed up outside the Imperial Station, reportedly dressed in a very inappropriate manner. The man left the property, but shortly thereafter returned in his vehicle and drove through the station's parking lot. Moments later, Kelly received what has only been described as an obscene phone call. Kelly's sister, Debbie, later reported that calls of this nature were not an uncommon occurrence at the station. Contrary to many reports, Kelly Dove actually made three telephone calls from the Imperial Station to the Harrisonburg Police Department that morning. At 2.27 a.m., Kelly placed the first of these calls, calls which were fielded by police dispatcher Martha Yankee. Not long after Kelly's disappearance, the transcripts of the first two calls were made public and have been quoted from extensively over the decades. However, in 2022, authorities released the actual audio of the first conversation. In it, Kelly can be heard reporting the unnerving events to the police dispatcher. Seven, three, um, I'm working the third shift at the Imperial Gas Station. I just had an obscene phone call, and this guy came in earlier, and he was kind of dressed improperly, but I kind of ignored him. I think it was that guy, because he just drove through the parking lot a few seconds before I got the call. Could, you know, you have somebody kind of keep an eye out on me? Okay, this is on... Main Street. South Main? Uh-huh. Over beside McDonald's. Thank you. Bye. Two minutes later, at 2.29 a.m., Kelly again called the Harrisonburg Police Department. The transcript indicates that the audio tape skipped several times during the call, partially muffling Kelly's words. Authorities were able to make out, this is just back parking lot. The dispatcher asked Kelly what kind of car the man was driving, to which Kelly replied, a silver-colored Ford. The exact time is not known, but Kelly placed her third and final call very soon thereafter. Kelly again repeated her request that the authorities come to the station, though reportedly with more urgency than a few minutes previous. Kelly's sister Elaine later opined that she detected fear in Kelly's voice. Sister Debbie, after listening to the second tape, reported to the press, You can hear a shuffle? and the phone snaps, indicating that the line went dead. 
A short time later, Harrisonburg police officer Sam Yankee, husband of dispatcher Martha Yankee, arrived at the Imperial Station. He found it deserted. He also found Kelly's purse, cigarettes, some cash, and a magazine she had been reading lying on the checkout counter. Yankee noted that the magazine had been folded back. No money was missing from the till, and there were no signs of a struggle or fight. Yankee later stated that it simply appeared as though Kelly had stepped away for a moment. Police contacted Kelly's mother, Rachel, and husband, Dale. It was later reported that there was some initial confusion concerning a car. Police at first thought that Kelly had been abducted from the station in a car she had driven there. It was about an hour later before Dale Dove was able to advise them that he had driven Kelly to the station the previous evening. Given the neat appearance of the scene, police at first questioned whether Kelly had actually been abducted and wondered if she may have left of her own accord. However, a staunch defense by Kelly's family, along with the logic that she was unlikely to have left both cash and her cigarettes behind, quickly steered authorities back to the abduction theory. A short time later, Harrisonburg police learned that another employee at a local convenience store had called 911 earlier in the evening to report an eerily similar incident. A blonde-headed male in his early 20s had come by the store and exposed himself to the clerk. The man left without further incident, but the clerk was sufficiently shaken to report the incident to police. The clerk described the man as Caucasian, between 20 and 25 years of age, with shoulder-length blonde hair. He had a thin build and was approximately 5 feet 10 inches tall. However, police later lamented that, without being flippant, the description could easily fit half the male student population at nearby James Madison University. Using an identikit, police created this composite image of the man's face. The features were so general and so common that the image was not even made public until decades later. To this day, the man remains unidentified and authorities still cannot be sure if he is in any way connected with Kelly Dove's disappearance. From the outset, authorities were frustrated by a significant lack of real evidence. Given the lighting conditions and the tinted windows at the station, they could not even be certain if Kelly's description of a silver-colored Ford was accurate. Could the vehicle have perhaps been gray or in primer? Could it have been another model similar to that of a Ford? What make? What model? What year? Many questions, but precious few answers. Publicity concerning Kelly's apparent abduction prompted a number of leads to be phoned in. However, they unfortunately also led to at least one childish diversion. In early July, a 17-year-old girl in neighboring Augusta County reported that a man bearing a close resemblance to the suspect in the Kelly case had attempted to abduct both herself and a friend. The incident caused an immediate stir in Augusta County. Police responded, but the young girl's story soon began to fall apart. After three days of questioning, the young lady admitted that she had fabricated the story an unnamed police detective would only lament, quote, the girl has got a problem, end quote. Facing such an extreme lack of useful information, the Harrisonburg Police Department even turned to a psychic for help, Noreen Rainier of Barbersville, Virginia. Later, when asked where Kelly could be found, Miss Rainier would only comment, quote, at a high point, in some woods, there is some concealment, not a burial, but concealment. Rainier, a former skeptic who reportedly honed her own psychic skills, lamented that the case was a very frustrating one for her as well. Contributing heavily to the frustration was the lack of a witness to any of the events which had transpired. 
The Imperial Station, where Kelly Dove was working on June 18, 1982, was located here, adjacent to Route 11, also known as South Main Street. The station itself was demolished in 2009 to make way for a new four-lane roadway. Today, the surrounding area is virtually unrecognizable from what it was 40 years ago. In 1982, the region around the station was undergoing development but was still very open and rural. The station itself was clearly visible to only two nearby properties. The McDonald's restaurant Kelly referenced in her call to police was over 200 yards away to the south. The early hour and dim lighting would have also made observation even more difficult. As the days turned into weeks, hope began to fade. Authorities continued to field tips called in by telephone, but all eventually led to a dead end. In 1985, Lieutenant Hubert Myers revealed that the Harrisonburg Police Department had developed a prime suspect based on his activities and automobile. Myers even went so far as to say that he was 99% sure the man's car was the one which had been seen near the Imperial Station. However, the lack of any real evidence has continually prevented charges from being filed. Despite the frozen nature of the case, Kelly's family have refused to give up. Year after year, often on or around the anniversary of Kelly's disappearance, her sisters and mother have been consistent in their efforts to keep Kelly's case in the news. Often, it was an uphill struggle. By 1985, Kelly Dove's case file had swelled to nearly 500 pages of interviews and notes, but as for solid evidence, there was precious little beyond the audio of Kelly's telephone calls and the vague description of a possible suspect in his vehicle. Not enough to merit even an arrest, let alone a conviction. Kelly Berg Dove was declared legally dead in 1989. Authorities, as well as Kelly's family, have long since concluded that Kelly is likely no longer among the living. This has not, however, dampened their desire to see her case through to a resolution. In 2020, the Harrisonburg Police Department officially reopened the case of Kelly Dove. Today, the investigation is being led by Detective Brooke Weatherell. Weatherell acknowledges that they are facing a difficult race against the clock. Authorities and Kelly's family are hopeful that someone who either knows or saw something will finally come forward. Today, the plot of land where the Imperial Gas Station once stood has been cut and filled beyond recognition. Only this short section of bound concrete, which composed its southern exit lane, remains as a memorial to the events of June 1982. The spot where the service building once stood is now hidden behind a man-made earth embankment. However, if one ascends the five to six feet of relocated earth and looks down at the spot where Kelly Dove was last seen, they will be met with a sight that seems somehow apropos. The expanse of concrete, metal, and petroleum-soaked surfaces have been replaced by a thick blanket of large wildflowers. Not quite a monument to Kelly Dove's memory, but a poignant reminder nonetheless. Five years later, and over 50 miles to the south, authorities found themselves faced with yet another confounding mystery. An unidentified young man found murdered along the busy lanes of Interstate 81. At first, it appeared to be a fairly routine John Doe case. An unknown individual murdered by a person nor persons unknown. However, in short order, this routine case would take a surprising turn, a turn which provided authorities with the identity of the killer, but continues to deny them the identity of the Rockbridge County John Doe. 
Along with tourists and pleasure seekers, the Shenandoah Valley is also an important north-south corridor for transportation and commerce. Each day, goods of every conceivable shape and size pass between its ridges along Interstate 81 and its main arteries. Both long- and short-haul truckers are very frequent visitors. To facilitate the needs of those who call the road their home, several truck stops and travel plazas have sprung up along the off-traveled route. Over the years, the profession of trucking and the image of the truck stop have been both romanticized and castigated in popular culture. The lure of the open road and the peaceful solitude it provides versus the dark loneliness and emotional detachment which can result. Some view these stopover spots as a general necessity and an encouragement to commerce. Others view them as dirty, rowdy pits occupied by roughneck drivers and lot lizards. The latter of these two opinions was once again thrust into the limelight in 1987. In May of that year, workers were laboring to repair stretches of shoulder along Interstate 81, a job which brings into view areas of forest, mountains, and fields that are often hidden from motorists. As these workers slowly inch their way towards mile marker 183 along the southern lanes, their daily routine of rigorous labor was abruptly brought to a halt. Just over a small embankment and out of sight of passing cars, workers came upon a set of badly decomposed human remains. Given the rural location of the find, members of the Virginia State Police were dispatched to the scene. County Medical Examiner F. A. Fetterman would later determine that the remains were those of a male and that he had been shot at least once in the head. The remains, along with a plethora of personal effects, were collected at the scene and retained as evidence. One item in particular, a badly waterlogged pocket notebook, provided authorities with an early and solid lead. It appeared that their John Doe had recently hitched a ride in a long-haul truck. For whatever reason, the man had jotted down the name of the owners of the truck in which he had ridden, the trucking firm of J.B. Hunt. Authorities soon ascertained that the J.B. Hunt Trucking Company was located in Lowell, Arkansas. A cross-check of dates and locations turned up the name of John Stephen Schwartz, a resident of Channel View, Texas. Investigators were able to confirm that Schwartz had transported a shipment of toys from Texas to New Jersey about two weeks earlier, a trek which would logically have taken him up Interstate 81 to connect with I-76. The location and time frame fit the estimated date and location of the John Doe's murder. Authorities tracked Schwartz to Texas. During an interview, he at first denied any involvement or knowledge of the incident. Then, just before he was scheduled to take a polygraph test, Schwartz broke down and confessed to the murder. Schwartz began to talk, and little by little, the events leading up to the murder of the Rockbridge County John Doe began to unfold. According to Schwartz, he first met the man, whom he came to know only as Chris, on May 16, 1987, at a Petro truck stop in Withville, Virginia, while en route to Edison, New Jersey, from Little Rock, Arkansas. Chris had apparently become stranded at the truck stop for several days with no food. Chris stated that he was on his way to somewhere to go camping, perhaps along the Appalachian Trail. Schwartz struck up a deal with the man. If he would accompany him to New Jersey and help him to unload his truck, he would pay him $50. The pair traveled on towards New Jersey, but according to Schwartz, the two did not talk much along the way. On May 18th, the pair arrived in Edison, and Chris helped Schwartz unload the vehicle and was paid the promised $50. Chris reportedly used the money to purchase some food and a folding knife. 
At some point during their stay in New Jersey, things began to turn sour. According to Schwartz, Chris demanded another $100 in payment, as well as some of Schwartz's personal items. Chris reportedly threatened to report Schwartz for having carried an unauthorized passenger on his route. Backed into a corner, Schwartz consented. On May 19, 1987, Schwartz picked up a new load of cargo and began the return drive to Arkansas, with Chris in tow. Schwartz stated that during the return trip, he stopped at a truck stop in Rayfine, Virginia, just a few miles north of Stanton. During this stop, Chris is said to have become agitated. He reportedly pulled his knife on Schwartz and again demanded $100 and some personal items. Chris reportedly threatened to physically harm Schwartz in some way. Schwartz continued south on I-81, with Chris still riding shotgun. At approximately 4 a.m., and just north of mile marker 183, Schwartz pulled his truck to the side of the road and told Chris that he needed to relieve himself. Both men apparently alighted from the cab. The exact series of events is unknown, but Schwartz later stated that he pulled a gun on Chris to let him know who was in charge. Chris reportedly made some sort of aggressive move, at which time Schwartz shot him once in the abdomen. Chris fell to the ground, and Schwartz fired another round into the right side of Chris's head. Death would have been almost certainly instantaneous. Schwartz did his best to hide the evidence of the incident. He removed Chris's body and personal effects to an area well off the interstate and out of sight of motorists. It was only by sheer chance that shoulder work commenced in the exact same area eight days later. Had it not been for this, Chris may well have remained undiscovered for years, possibly giving his invaluable personal effects time to return to the earth. According to Schwartz, Chris frequently changed his story concerning who he was and where he was going. The remains of the man John Schwartz knew as Chris were found in this general area, roughly eight miles south of Lexington, Virginia, on the western side of Interstate 81. The highway is a frequently traveled route by both civilian and commercial vehicles. According to Schwartz, he first picked Chris up here, at what was then a Petro truck stop in Withville, Virginia, the conjunction of Interstate 77 and 81. Chris is reported to have stated that he had been at the truck stop for two days, which would have had him arriving there on May 14th or 15th. Just where Chris had been prior to arriving at the Petro station is unknown. Chris said something about trying to get somewhere to go camping. Chris spent the next three days with Schwartz. If the two interacted with any other individuals during this time, the details have not been made public. John Schwartz was subsequently found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. He was killed in a prison altercation in 1999. The killer was behind bars. However, authorities still face the conundrum of an unidentified victim. The advanced decomposition had eradicated all of Chris's facial features. However, authorities were able to obtain at least some fingerprints, along with remnants of brown hair. Authorities theorize that Chris may have been a transient owing to the condition and number of items found both near and on his person. Following local media exposure, authorities received a number of leads concerning Chris's possible identity, but none of them panned out. With all leads exhausted, Special Agent Mike Peters turned to forensic scientist Thomas Goyne to construct a three-dimensional clay sculpture of Chris's face. Using the skull found alongside I-81, Goyne sculpted this rendering, which subsequently appeared in both local and national media. Most of Chris's clothing was still intact. 
When found, he was attired in blue jeans with a brown belt. The belt was speckled with white paint and sported a square buckle with a longhorn steer. He was also clad in a heavy brown coat with a fur or wool interior. The heavy coat was worn over top of a Spec 4 U.S. Army-issued short sleeve shirt with appropriate insignia. He had on a pair of brown slip-over type shoes over top of a pair of white sweat socks with green and yellow ankle stripes. Of particular interest were a set of black plastic-framed military-issue eyeglasses found on or near the body. They have been identified as the type issued by the U.S. Veterans Administration to former service members. The lenses were determined to have been for someone who was nearsighted. The exact prescription is as follows. Right lens, OD, negative 2.25 spherical, 5 pH cylindrical. Left, OS, negative 2.25 spherical, 5 pH cylindrical. Distance PD equals 61 millimeters, BC 4.25 OV. The lenses were also single vision and clear glass. This chain and crucifix were also found on Chris's body. A number of personal items were found nearby, including this fold-up switchblade knife, a cheap white big ballpoint pen, a white disposable cigarette lighter, an audio cassette tape, a $10 bill along with 12 cents in change, this metal wristwatch with both analog and digital features, and this pocket-sized notebook into which Chris has made several entries. Authorities noted that Chris misspelled several common words. The man known only as Chris was estimated to have been approximately 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighing about 150 pounds. His hair was brown in color and his mouth was described as wedge-shaped and narrow. He was initially estimated to have been between 20 and 22 years of age. However, recent descriptions have revised this estimate up now giving a range of 20 to 40 years of age. Some online forums and web pages refer to the man as Veteran Doe. It must be stressed that the presence of military-issued items does not necessarily mean that this individual was ever a member of the U.S. Armed Forces. Both the shirt and eyeglasses could have been obtained at either a thrift or surplus store. More importantly, authorities point out that they are far from certain that the John Doe's first name is actually Chris. In each of these cases, authorities feel they are close to a resolution, each requiring perhaps only one piece to complete the puzzle. One piece to identify a kidnapper, another to identify a victim. Perhaps we will one day learn just what happened to Kelly Berg Dove on the morning of June 18, 1982. Perhaps we will one day learn the true identity of the Rockbridge County John Doe. Perhaps the ultimate resolution to one of these intriguing cases lies with you. Today, Kelly Berg Dove would be 60 years old. When she disappeared in 1982, she was 5 feet 1 inches tall, weighed between 100 and 120 pounds, had brown hair, brown eyes, and a scar on her left elbow, forehead, and the back of her neck. When she was last seen, she was attired in a light-colored v-neck sweater with pinstriping, tan or cream-colored pants, leather sandals, eyeglasses, and her 1978 Turner Ashby High School graduation ring. At the time, she smoked Marlboro cigarettes. Given that Kelly left her purse, money, and cigarettes behind, authorities believe she did not leave of her own accord. Kelly was last heard from at approximately 2.30 a.m. on June 18, 1982. 
She was working the graveyard shift at the former Imperial Oil Station, which was located along South Main Street in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Kelly is known to have made three telephone calls to the Harrisonburg Police Department in the moments leading up to her disappearance. She reported being troubled by an unidentified Caucasian male, whom she stated had been in the store earlier, dressed in an inappropriate manner. Police have theorized that the man may have been seen earlier that evening at another convenience store. He was driving what has been described as a gray or silver Ford, make, model, and year unknown. The man seen earlier that evening has been described as a white male, possibly between the ages of 20 and 25. He had a slender build, shoulder-length blonde hair, which was described as being dirty, was approximately 5 feet 10 inches tall, and was wearing a light-colored shirt. Police believe it is likely that the man is a local resident. The Rock Ridge County John Doe was found off the side of Interstate 81, just north of mile marker 183 along the southbound lanes. Police estimated that the body had lain where it was found for at least one week. Death had occurred as the result of a gunshot wound to the head. It was later determined that the man had hitched a ride with J.B. Hunt truck driver John Schwartz at what was then a Petco truck stop in Whitfield, Virginia, on May 16, 1987. The man rode with Schwartz to Edison, New Jersey, and then accompanied him on the return route south. Just north of mile marker 183, Schwartz shot and killed the man. He later advised that he knew him only as Chris, though authorities have not been able to confirm this name. The unidentified man was estimated to have been approximately 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighed about 150 pounds. His hair was brown in color and his mouth was described as wedge-shaped and narrow. He was initially estimated to have been between 20 and 22 years of age. However, recent descriptions have revised this estimate up, now giving a range of 20 to 40 years of age. Some online forums and web pages refer to the man as Veteran Doe, though his status with any branch of the U.S. Armed Forces has not been confirmed. When found, the man was attired in blue jeans with a brown belt sporting a square buckle with a longhorn steer. He was also clad in a heavy brown coat with a fur or wool interior. The heavy coat was worn over top of a Spec 4 U.S. Army issue short-sleeved shirt with insignia. He had on a pair of brown slip-over type shoes over top of a pair of white sweat socks with green and yellow ankle stripes. A set of black plastic-framed military-issue eyeglasses were found on or near the body. They have been identified as the type issued by the U.S. Veterans Administration to former service members. The lenses were determined to have been for someone who was near-sighted. A number of personal items were also on or near the remains. These included this chain and crucifix, this fold-up switchblade knife, a cheap white Bic ballpoint pen, a white disposable cigarette lighter, an audio cassette tape, a $10 bill along with 12 cents in change, this metal wristwatch with both analog and digital features, and this pocket-sized notebook into which Chris had made several entries. Authorities noted that Chris misspelled several common words. If you have any information concerning the disappearance of Kelly Berg Dove, please contact Detective Brooke Weatherell with the Harrisonburg Police Department at 540-434-4436. If you have any information concerning the identity of the Rockbridge County John Doe, please contact the Virginia State Police BCI at 540-375-9546 
or the office of the Chief Medical Examiner for the Central District at 804-786-3174. Thank you.